Welcome to this new video. We will continue the median nerve neuropathy, but now we're going to discuss the median nerve uh, irritation or compression at the carpal tunnel uh, area. So this is the most common, this is something to memorize, the most common mononeuropathy, meaning a neuropathy involving one nerve only. This is the most common one. And it's called carpal tunnel syndrome, um, where the median nerve might be irritated or compressed at the level of the carpal tunnel. So the most, it's the most common mononeuropathy and usually, typically, the prevalence is, is women. Women are more prevalent than men and between the age of 45, 65, it's the most common age. And it's related with um, either traumatic or just by irritation, mechanical irritation, could be called uh, carpal tunnel syndrome dynamic, carpal, uh, dynamic carpal tunnel syndrome or compressive carpal tunnel syndrome. Usually dynamic carpal tunnel syndrome are related with younger, uh, at younger age, people who tend to work a lot on the computer or do a lot of prone, pronosupination movements or a lot of uh, repeti repetitive movements of flexion extension, flexion extension, that basically stretches the nerve and irritates the nerve. Um, and older ages, between 45 and 65, uh, can be related with just the narrowing of the space of the tunnel, tunnel canal, so the carpal tunnel canal. <clears throat> the carpal tunnel is formed by the radius and the ulna, the distal radius and, uh, and ulna, and also the flexor uh, retinaculum, and also between two big tendons called the flexocarpi radialis and the long palmar of the hand. So the median nerve can be compressed here. It's also related with some diseases, uh, some autoimmune disease, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, can cause some inflammation at the level of the wrist, uh, diabetic neuropathy. But as I said in the beginning, the most common cause is indeed the mechanical one, unless there's an a under, underlying disease like diabetes or a rheumatoid arthritis, as an example. Just as a curiosity, we have a huge number of fibroblasts in our forearm and wrists and chins and behind our eyes. So typically, diseases that cause edema and inflammation will affect tissues at the level of the forearm, leg or eyes. The typical case is a Graves disease where the eyes protrude. But anyways, going back to the median nerve. So let's remember the anterior interosseous nerve innervates the flexor digitorio profundus and the long flexor of the thumb. So the median nerve at this level has nothing to do with those muscles. So the, chrona the, the, um, the pronator quadratus, it's innervated by the median nerve at this level, and the median nerve at this level innervates the intrinsic uh, muscles of the hand. So there's a nice way to, dec to, to memorize the, the muscles of the hand, almost, of the, almost all of the muscles of the hand innervated by the median nerve at this level, which is the mnemonic LOAF. LOAF stands for lumbrical muscles, the first and the second lumbrical muscles. The O stands for opponent, opponent of the thumb, the muscle opponent of the thumb. A stands for abductor of the thumb, and F stands for flexor of the thumb. Remember, there's two flexors. The long flexor is innervated by the anterior interosseous nerve. The short or brevis flexor is innervated by the median nerve. Just as a curiosity, the thumb, mo almost all muscles of the thumb are innervated by the median nerve, and some people consider the median nerve the nerve of ev evolution. Throughout the human life, we evolved in a way that we could manage tools and fabricate tools and manage our environment. So the muscles of the thumb are very important in terms of evolution because thanks to the thumb, we'll be able to actually manipulate the environment. And this is why the median nerve is important in that sense because it innervates almost all muscles of the thumb except the adductor of the thumb and the extensor of the thumb. So based on what I said now, a median nerve compression at the wrist will give many times wasting, especially in chronic conditions, wasting of the intrinsic muscles of the hand. So we will see a wasting of the abductor of the thumb, of the opponent of the thumb, of the brevis flexor of the thumb. So you, you will see, looking at the hand of the patient, for instance, you would see, so usually people, well, patients are people, but usually people without carpal tunnel syndrome will, will have 
this protrusion here, which is basically the, the, all the muscles of the thumb that I've been referring to. And we'll see this intrinsic muscles of the hand are quite, quite strong. And quite, in carpal tunnel syndrome, especially in chronic conditions, you would see a dip. You'd see a depression of this area, which basically means a wasting of this, of this muscles. And the patient will also feel uh, less strength, especially in grip. So typically, let's say a typical patient with 65-year-old woman with a carpal tunnel syndrome with some severity will, will typically say, I can't even hold a glass or she can't do this, flex the thumb, she holds the glass like this. Sometimes she says she, she drops things and this is a typical carpal tunnel syndrome in its most severe condition. So a way to test the median nerve at the wrist using the neurodynamic principles, you have to uh, uh, tension the wrist first and then do the other parameters. We're going to do that uh, next. Also remember, always remember, that it's possible on most nerves of the leg and arm to do a tinel signal. The tinel signal means a tapping on the nerve. So really palpate the nerve and compress the nerve. So a carpal tunnel syndrome um, could be positive at this uh, tapping. A anterior interosseous uh, nerve neuropathy could be positive at this. And this is a fundamental key, guys. Osteopaths do touch. Most doctors don't touch, so they, you know, you lose a lot of information if you don't touch and palpate, and it's very important to palpate. Let's lay down on the back. Please. So our neurodynamic test will start at the wrist. Now, remember, to test, we first cause tension at the, at the, uh, at the area we want to test, okay? So we won't start here. We won't start at the elbow. We have to start at the wrist because we're assessing the wrist. So first position, extension of the wrist, extension of the first three fingers. Very important, the thumb. Look at my, look at my index, like this. And then we add the other components. So if the median nerve is basically medial and anterior, the elbow needs to be extended and supinated and the hand needs to be extended. And then we're gonna add the other components. If we do externally rotate and abduct, we're stretching the media, medial part of the median nerve. And then we're gonna ask the patient to flex his head. So I'm gonna start, not, not yet, thank you. I'm gonna start from the beginning, extend, supinate, extend the elbow, look at my leg now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my leg and it's gonna help me on the abduction and externally rotate. When the patient starts to complain, which is basically now, I can feel the tension. I'm gonna ask the patient to laterally flex the neck, the head, don't rotate, more like, yes, perfect. And if that movement distally to the problem increases the symptoms, we have a positive neurodynamic test. So how are we gonna treat these patients? Depends if it's in an, an acute phase or chronic phase. If it's in an acute phase, we do a gliding techniques. If it's in a chronic phase, attention techniques. So the principles is always the same, are always the same. <clears throat> Let's look at the carpal tunnel here. And the median nerve runs through here and then sends off some uh, cutaneous branches at the, at the first, second and third finger. So a gliding technique, for instance, at the wrist, if the patient can tolerate that, could be like this. Extension of the wrist. Extension of the wrist. And look at his, look at his fingers now. They're flexed, they're relaxed, they have some slack there. So the gliding technique is this. You pull one end and you release the other one. So like this. And then look at my hand now. The, my hand is gonna do all the technique. If I, if, I, if, I, if I rotate my hand or my arm like this, I'm immediately flexing the, the wrist. So look at the technique now. When I, pull, when I put my hand in the normal position, I'm stretching the fingers, causing tension on the fingers, and the wrist comes automatically to flex position. If, if I dip my hand in, the, the wrist goes into extension and his fingers go into flexion. So if I do this, if my hand just do this movement like this, I'm doing a dynamic glide on, at the median nerve side, at the carpal tunnel side, okay? So like this and like this. Extend and bend, flex the wrist and stretch the fingers. 
So very, it should be slower than this, it should be something like this. And very soft. And again, the patient should not feel any uncomfortable uh, symptoms. Well, symptoms are uncomfortable anyways, but he should not be feeling any symptoms because the risk of his, uh, of his getting worse in this case, the patient getting worse, it's immense. So you have to be careful with this. Another technique which is very valuable, and it, again, it goes for every nerve. It's at the same time you're doing a neuromobilization or neurodynamic, we mobilize the nerve also at the same time. And especially the fascia around the nerve. Some, some patients in acute phase, they don't like the nerve to be directly immobilized. So we can use the fascia around, uh, called the mesoneural fascia, around the nerve, just, just, just to do some myo, almost like a myofascial technique, but around the nerve. So if we imagine a nerve here, we don't go directly on the nerve, but around the nerve as we mobilize the hand. So something like this. Or we can even mobilize the carpal tunnel, let's say the flexor retinaculum, at the same time of a neurodynamic technique. For instance, I can ask the patient to extend the wrist and his fingers in a, in a very comfortable position, and then he relax the hand, and he continuously doing that without causing symptoms. And at the same time, I'm opening the canal. So I'm stretching the retinaculum flex, continue the movement, the retinaculum flexor, continue. I'm mobilizing the radius and the, the ulnar, continue, extend the knee, the, the wrist, continue, 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 no, don't stop. And I'll, and I'll just mobilize the median nerve at the same time. See, we can do a combination of techniques, neurodynamic and others. So now we're gonna go to a tension technique, a tensioner technique which is, as you, as you know by now, it causing tension on both ends, both parts of the nerve. So we're gonna start at the wrist and at the fingers, tension here. We add the tension to the rest of the forearm, and this is an example of a tension technique at the level of the median nerve. So basically it's the same technique we did before in the, in the previous video uh, of the anterior interosseous nerve. So tension on both ends and relax. When I say relax, this is always a passive technique. I mean, just, just relax in terms of, of uh, gaining some slack of the nerve. So tension, tension. And again, this technique is for more chronic conditions, not acute conditions. And we should aim, and on every treatment, we should aim for, the goal is to gain some range of motion. You, typically five degrees is already a big deal. So let's imagine the patient goes to the, uh, the consultation, starts the treatment, and at this extension is already painful. By the time we finish one treatment, if we can gain, let's say, five degrees of extension of the wrist, it's already a big thing if he doesn't have any pain. And this gradually will develop, evolve into a, a protocol of treatments that usually three, four, five treatments in a chronic condition is enough to treat this patient. And this concludes the techniques. Thank you. Thank you.